Good morning and welcome to Trinity. If you're a guest here today, I want to give you a special good morning and I invite you to reach out in the pew rack and find one of these cards. Take just a moment, give us a little bit of information about yourself and put it in the offering plate later on in the service and, and uh, share some information about yourself and we'll send some stuff about Trinity and, and we'll get to know each other just a little bit better and uh, uh, we'll just share one, a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Trinity and we'll get to know each other a little bit better. Now, take out your bulletin and we'll go over the announcements and see what's happening around here the next few days. Right after this service, all of our teachers and their families are invited to go down to the Fellowship Hall and we've got a special lunch and training. We're going to have a barbecue dinner and uh, uh, all your families are invited to attend that. We've got child care for everyone. Uh, we would invite the children to eat with your families and uh, then go to the rooms. We've got signs for everyone. So uh, notice that. Uh, if you don't know what room to go to, if you got a question, you can see me or see Teresa. I'd prefer you to ask Teresa first. <laughs> hey, what do you mean, hey? <laughs> Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a Mexican Covered Dish Fellowship. You can wear a Trinity t-shirt. We'd like you to do that because we're going to make a photograph and we'll like everybody in a Trinity t-shirt. <laughs> For your viewing pleasure. That's enough of that. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I've done a lot more and got a lot less, so thanks very much. That starts at, this doesn't start at 6, that ended just now, but the, uh, the supper starts at 6, wear a t-shirt, that'll be a lot of fun, uh, just a lot of fun tonight, wear a t-shirt, we're going to make a, uh, a photograph, come on out, that is a lot of fun. Uh, our children's choirs, they kick off tonight at 5.30 and they'll be finished by 6, so the children will be able to come to the fellowship. Also notice there in the bulletin, there's a schedule on the bottom right hand side of your bulletin list of all kinds of uh, activities for the children's choirs. Tonight at 7, the handbells will be meeting. Wednesday night, look over there on the back side of your bulletin. Wednesday night, the, our, our dinners will be kicking off in a big way. Pot roast, I mean pork roast, I'm sorry, pork roast, mashed potatoes, gravy, rolls, green beans, salad bar, peach cobbler. If my t-shirt gets a hand, I think that gets a hand. <laughs> Uh, that starts at 4.45 and uh, served till about 6 o'clock. Please see the announcement about next Sunday's church council and workshop for 2015, 16, and 16, 17 chairpersons. Um, it'll be going from 4 to 6 p.m. And then also uh, the Youth Praise Team 1 will meet today at 5 p.m. in the youth room, and that'll be tonight. Okay? At this time, I invite you to stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. Last week we uh, began a series on C.S. Lewis classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Last week we discussed the role of the lion being similar to Christ. Today we look at the witch. Welcome to Trinity. Yes, bro. 
Alright. Dear Heavenly Father, open our minds and our hearts as we receive your message today. Lord, I pray for those who lost worldly, all their worldly possessions due to nature and those who lost loved ones. Lord, I pray for our troubled nation and that you will guide us to make a difference and serve you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of praise, hymn number 16, O Worship the King. Please stand as we sing together. Please be seated. Barbara Brown Taylor has written many religious books and many, many more sermons, uh, but she says that she uh, is a failure at prayer, or at least the kind of prayer that is focused enough and selfish and theologically correct enough to make it worthy for God to listen to. I, I think we can probably all relate to, to that feeling, but she said it has helped her to think more broadly of prayer as the practice of being present to God. And that includes finding times throughout the day to listen and look for God's presence at work in our world. Be still and know is the perfect time to think and pray about what it means to practice being present to God. I invite you to join me in silence in doing that at this time. Oh God, we thank you for being present to us at all times. Help us to may, may pay more attention to that, uh, to see your love at work in the world, and to know that you always go before us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture lesson is from Luke 22, verses 1 through 6. Now the festival of the unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of guidance, hymn number 450, I Need Thee Every Hour. Please stand as we sing together. like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh bless me now my Savior, I come to Good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. I wanted to do the missions moment this morning and give you a little update about some of the work that I've been a part of over the last two or three years with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. CBF is one of our primary missions partners and in 2012 there was a task force that recommended some changes to the way CBF is organized and doing its work. I was uh, blessed to be uh, asked to serve on the missions council. So we looked at our missions environment and several things happened as we thought about wanting to make our missions work more clear, uh, more focused, and sustainable. And as we looked at it, we realized several things have happened related to missions in the world. One is the majority of Christians no longer live in Europe and North America. 
in our world today. Uh, secondly, we've noticed that there in our community, even here in Alabama, there are, are people from around the world who live in the United States. This is sort of a world without borders in some sense, right? And uh, we also noticed that, uh, that more people want to be hands-on involved in missions than used to be. This is called the missional m movement that began in the 90s. So a lot more money is given to short-term mission trips. So all of that was an environment of our new missionary situation we were encountering. We also looked at the fact that the current model we were having, which was sending American missionaries overseas and keeping them there for long, long periods of time, was not sustainable. It would lead us to, at some point in time, of recalling missionaries who had been on the field mostly for their, their almost their entire lives. So we were looking about how to address that in a prayerful and dialogical way uh, for the past two years, particularly we worked on this. And at our meeting in Greensboro, South uh, North Carolina this summer, the fellowship affirmed our new model and I wanted to tell you just briefly about it. One of the things we did was to focus in on the work that we do and we call those three contexts. We can't do everything, CBF is a relatively small Christian missions organization. So we focused in on three areas. One is the global church. We think about when we do missions in a way that has a sense of equality to it as opposed to the American missionary that we send and we just decide where to go. We want to do it in partnership with those brothers and sisters who live and work in indigenous people around the world. So we think about it in the context of what the global church is doing, not just what the American church or the Baptist church is doing. Secondly is global uh, poverty. So our work is focused on issues related to what happens when poverty happens to people in their lives. And that's the kind of work that we feel drawn to do and feel led to do. We think about Jesus being particularly uh, fond of and loving and ministering to the poorest of the poor in the world. And that's still true for us. And global migration. We live in a time when more people are moving around in the world than at any other point in the history uh, of, of humankind. And so we think about those kind of issues. And by the way, as an aside, uh, I, I've often told people personally, but never I think from the pulpit, if you have a heart for the refugees, and we saw that picture of that little boy this week that sort of brought it all back to our minds, hopefully. Uh, we have had missionaries working in southern Turkey and other places in, that we can't name who they are because for their safety and for the safety of the people they work with. But from day one of the civil war and the conflict in Syria, we've had people working with refugees. And when you give to your church, it not only helps the, ministry, the ministries of our congregation, our church here in Madison, but you're also already helping uh, people who are working with the refugees around the world. Just wanted you to know that. Then the third thing, that, that, the second thing I wanted to tell you was those are our context of where we work and what we, and, and the kind of people we work with, but the, what kind of work was important to us. And so we came up with three commitments. One was a phrasing we borrowed from Dr. Martin Luther King to cultivate beloved community. Sort of goes along with the idea of uh, the sense of the global church. We want to be invited to places as opposed to us deciding in a board meeting in Atlanta or, or Nashville or Richmond that we know where the world needs help. We wanted to sort of be invited and do this in partnership and we wanted to think about working alongside people as equals and that's very very important to us and somehow that it cultivates a sense of the brotherhood and sisterhood that Jesus Christ prayed for when he prayed for unity on the last night of his life. The second thing is to bear witness to Jesus Christ. And that, simply put, is the way that we think about sharing uh, our faith in Jesus so that others have the opportunity to respond and hopefully accept Christ as their own Lord and Savior in a personal way. And then the third way, as we think about it, is things that we could do that would we call transformational development. A simple way to think about it is what we've often heard is you can give a person a fish or teach them how to fish. So we wanted to think about work and projects that we do around the world that would last and that would be transformational in nature for the people of the world. So all that's what the stuff we've been working on a lot this year, this last two years, and I want you to hear about it. You're a part of that. You're a missions-minded congregation. I really appreciate that about you. One of the specific things that I worked on was funding because without the funding we would have to call people back home. And one of the things we did was double down on the idea that we need people who stay in a place for a long period of time. Long term presence matters. It matters because they have to learn language, they have to learn culture, and they have to build relationships of trust. And you can't do that on a short term mission trip. You can't do that on a three year stint somewhere. That takes a long period of time. The primary way that we fund global missions is through the special offerings that we do 
during the Easter period at our church and at Christmas time. The offering for global missions is the, bu the funding budget to keep missionaries on the field. By the way, those missionaries are our host. When we go on short-term mission trips, they've developed the relationships and they know the puzzle of the work that we get to be a part of for a short period of time. Now, to help us all remember that, we had some t-shirts made up. I know this seems like t-shirt day. I've got some helpers because I got four t-shirts that I wanted to give out today. And when we were at our meeting, y'all come on and take your spots. When we were at our meeting in Greensboro, I told our, our uh, coordinator for global missions, wouldn't it be neat if we had a t-shirt cannon and we just shot all these shirts out? We didn't do that. But I said, I'm going to have some folks toss them out at church. So each section gets a shirt. And if you want another one, uh, let me know because we can order more for sure. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let them toss it out. And these shirts on the front have the logos of our context of global church global poverty and global migration on the back is what we do okay so get a t-shirt who knows great job all right <laughs> good 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 thank you I had a couple of goals that no one you know had, and there's a lawsuit because we hit them too hard or that the chandeliers fail so <laughs> great job great job let me offer a brief prayer for our missions in particular our missionaries let's pray our God, we thank you so much for those who have a sense of calling to serve you in this world and your causes. And you have invited all of us to be a part of it. So we are grateful. We ask you to help us by encouraging us and comforting us, but also challenging us to be involved by supporting missions, being personally hands-on involved, but also by praying and offering our financial resources so that your work continues gladly in this world. We bless and pray for our missionaries this morning. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. When our boys were little, I would uh, 
at night and bedtime get in the bed with them with a flashlight all four, all four of them all five of us and I would read stories to them most nights and one of the books that we read several times was from this copy and it's sort of torn the pages are coming out it's sort of torn up it's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, a Christian writer. And I was real pleased to hear back in the spring when our youth were doing a series of Bible studies based on the themes of this uh, Christian book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I thought I'd like to do a sermon series on it. So today we're in the second of the series. Last week we looked at the lion, the Christ figure in the book called Aslan, and what, it, uh, what that means for us uh, in our lives today. Today we're going to look at the witch. And I was talking to one of our musicians a little earlier, and uh, she was saying, gosh, you know, we saw the witch and we're thinking, how do you come up with an offertory for the witch? And so you'll find it's really, really good. And I think they said something calming. <laughs> so I wanted to begin by reading a passage from uh, this story. And it is a story of uh, a little girl who enters into this land of Narnia and she encounters a fawn. She doesn't know the fawn has these motivations that are not good. They're harmful to her, but she doesn't know it. And as he gets to know her, the fawn has regrets about what he's about to do or thinks he's going to do. And he calls himself a bad fawn. This is what he says. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you're a very good fawn. You're the nicest fawn I've ever met. It's the only one she's ever met, by the way. Oh, oh, you wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there ever was a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done, said Lucy. My old father now, said Mr. Tumnus, that's the picture over there on the mantelpiece, he would never have done a thing like this. A, a thing like what, said Lucy. Like what I've done, said the fawn, taking service under the white witch. That's what I am. I'm in the pay of the white witch. The white witch? Who is she? Why, it is she that has got all Narnia under her thumb. It's she that makes it always winter, always winter, and never Christmas. Think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you for? So today when I think about the white witch, I think about the theme of things that happen in our world that in the past particularly we would call evil. The existence of evil in the world. I was watching a news show where we have the talking heads talking to each other about political issues. And on this particular day, some time ago, they were talking about a crime that was so horrible that they were debating whether that this person was just an evil person. And one of them said, there's a lot of this evil that happens in the world. And the other says, no, 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 no. And so they were arguing over, the argument became over the existence of evil itself. And finally, one of the commentators said, do you think there's no evil in the world? And he, the other guy said, yes, there's no evil in the world. Does that make you feel better? Well, it does make me feel better if that's true. The question for a lot of us today is to have a, some sense of balance between denying the existence of anything that's evil in the world and finding the devil behind every tree, right? And, and so when I think about it, I think that a lot of us sense there are things that occur in the world that are so disturbing and so even sinfully wrong that we have to think it's beyond just sort of what naturally could occur, right? For me, my first encounter of that was when I was very young. I had a, an old 78 record, and it was, uh, I guess, a 45 record, those little small round records. And it was, the Beat, it was a Beatles record. On one side was a song you all would know. The other side was Helter Skelter by the Beatles. And I wondered, what is Helter Skelter about? And I started learning about it before the Internet, and I saw a picture of Charles Manson. It was about the Manson murders in 1969 and the trial of that cultish group. And when I saw the picture of Charles Manson, to me, that was my first encounter of what the devil might actually look like. It was so scary to me in the existence of evil. For you today, when you think about it, it could be because you've seen pictures or stories of the Holocaust from World War II, the concentration camps. And you have to think that's beyond what could exist without some kind of demonic or evil power behind that. Or maybe for you it was the genocide of Rwanda or the events of what happens when ISIS gets control of areas in our world today. Or Boko Haram, who we saw this week not only have a 
abducted, raped, and killed so many women, but also they said over 10,000 young boys and tried to convert them into boy or toy soldiers uh, in, in the fights in Africa. So we look at all that. Sometimes it's racial or gender hatred that we see that rises up in our world and we think that goes way beyond what a common decent person would even have. There's a story of a liberation of a concentration camp in World War II. The American GIs had liberated the camp and they wanted to parade the Jews who were still alive through the town where these people could see all of this horrific uh, inhumanity that had been done in the camp just outside their village. So they wanted these German citizens to see what had happened, to shame them and to, uh, to make them maybe change. And as they're walking them through town in these sort of walking skeletons, there are two 15-year-old boys on the side of the road in brown shirts. And as they see this parade of these walking skeletons of humanity, they are laughing at them. And they're pointing fingers and they're calling them names. And one of the GIs turned to his lieutenant and said, can I just shoot them right now. That's the way he felt about it. There's a book a few years ago called Alligator Candy. It's written by one of the contributing editors of Rolling Stone magazine. And it was about his story of growing up and his family dealing with the abduction of his older brother who was abducted and murdered. The brother had left home to ride his bike through a little trail to get some candy for his younger brother, the author of the book. And they had to deal with all the events of that happening. And in the book the author says, the biggest fairy tale I was ever told is that the world is safe. Evil, he said, is real. When I was a young minister, I sometimes had people in the congregation who would say, why does evil exist anyway in this world God created? How could God allow evil to exist? And honestly, I don't think we hear those questions near as much, and that's fine. I think the questions now for people ruminating around them is, does it even exist at all? We don't talk about it too much, and yet we still see stuff that happen in the world and we wonder how to even describe it. This is what one theologian said about it, Thomas Finger. Evil powers withdraw from sight into men, elements, and institutions through which they make their power felt to seem not to appear is part of their essence. Now I'll tell you in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the, Bible, the writers of the Bible do not take a lot of time dealing with the origins and the nature of evil in the world. The devil, Satan, the adversary of God, whatever you want to call it. The, the, the biblical story is God's story. They spend their time telling God's story. They're not out telling the story of Satan. So there's a little bit in there, but most of the story is about God's attempts to enter into our history in an effort to bring salvation and redemption to all of us because God loves each of us unconditionally. But biblical theology is clear that evil exists and it is not just some vague mystical notion out there. It takes a personal form in this world and acts. And I will tell you, if you underestimate the power of demonic forces in our world today, you will sometimes believe that you can contribute your own strength to fight it off and resist it all by yourself. And when you do that, you will find yourselves at times in a situation where you thought you could handle it by yourself because you underestimated its power or denied its reality. And you find yourself in situations where you are so trapped that you alone cannot get yourself out of that situation. Next year, it, we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther in 1517, uh, writing these 95 theses and nailing them to the Wittenberg door, the church there in Germany. And it changed the history of our world. And we're going to do a, a lot of talking about the Protestant Reformation because you know I love church history so much. And I'm pretty sure Martin Luther is going to come and address our congregation next year. I'm very excited about that. And uh, there's a story that I don't know for sure is true, but there are stories about his home in Germany where he would write and study, prepare his sermons and his books that he wrote. And sometimes you would hear him hollering because he had such an acute awareness of the presence of Satan fighting against him. So he would even holler sometimes in his room. And supposedly there are stains from the inkwell that sometimes he would take from his desk and throw it at Satan and tell him to flee from him and get out of his way. Who knows? But it was acute awareness of it. We sense that when we hear that great hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God. This is what Martin Luther wrote in the song. It says, For still our ancient foe doth seek to work his woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. 
C.S. Lewis, the writer of the Narnia story, said the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. But I will say to you, very, very often, it is not the devil or Satan who is to blame for the bad things and the wrong, horrible things that happen even in our own lives. I remember when I was younger, there was this shirt that said, the devil made me do it. There were little slogans. Did you ever see that? I even saw one on my news feed this week, it just coincidentally, that came up and it was a shirt that said, if you don't go to church, the devil's going to get you. There's some motivation there, right? I don't think we'll do those kind of t-shirts here at Trinity. <laughs> In the 300s, there were a whole group of Christians who said, we want to do our best to work for God's work in the world. And the way we want to do it is to go to the places where Jesus went at the beginning of His ministry. Out into the wilderness where the demonic forces in Jesus' story where Satan tempted Jesus out in the wilderness. We're going to go out there where the demons are and fight them there before they invade the cities and the villages of our people. And we will fight them by studying our Bibles and praying. We call them today the desert fathers and mothers. And there's one story of a young monk who came to an older one and talked and he says, why does the devil always attack me? And the older man said to him, Does he now? Oftentimes the devil has no concern about attacking us because our own self-wills do enough damage themselves. They create demons within us that make us fall. Uh, the devil is going to attack anybody. It's going to be people like Moses or something like that, he said. In psychology, we hear psychologists sometimes talk about within us. There's this death instinct that exists. And you may know it. It's a shadowy side of us. It's the, the something in us that makes us at times devious. They want to sabotage things. They have a perverted sense of something that sometimes rises up within us. C.S. Lewis said, inside of us exists a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambition, a nursery of fear, a harem of hatred, and their name is Legion. I mean, who among us doesn't have a weak spot? So here we come to Luke chapter 22. Did you hear this story? It's been one of the most remarkable stories of the last week of Jesus' life to me. These are religious leaders, religious leaders, and they have moved somehow from an intellectual debate with another religious leader that they vehemently disagree with, Jesus Christ. And as the religious leaders debate Jesus, they have moved from an intellectual discussion with Jesus and debates that are very hot until they come to a place where they believe that a plot to murder him will be the only thing that will do. They want to erase him and get rid of him. The Bible said they are delighted when one of Jesus' own disciples, a man named Judas Iscariot, comes and offers a deal for the betrayal of Jesus. The Bible says that's the moment that Satan entered into the heart of Judas and a plot is hatched. And it's interesting how Satan worked. And I don't know exactly why Judas did what he did, but it could be, I think, some possibilities. It could be because he got an exchange of money, pieces of silver, for betraying Jesus. We know that the other biblical writers, the disciples, felt like that he had such an attachment for money that he would almost do anything. So maybe Satan played on his love for money. Or maybe it was because Judas was part of a group called the Zealots who vehemently wanted to get the Romans out of their country to take their nation over again. And so he wanted to do everything he could in his power to push them out. And one of the high priests had said it's better for one person to die than the whole nation. So maybe that's what he was doing. And Satan's playing on it and perverting his zeal for God. Or it's just the fact that he says, I believe in Jesus and he can bring the kingdom, but I can't wait any longer. It needs to happen now, so I'm going to push Jesus and get him off God's time and get him on my time. I'm going to go ahead and put him face to face between the plotters and the religious leaders and the Roman authorities. And then I know Jesus is going to bring all the angels and the kingdom will come. Who knows what his motivation was, but wasn't Satan sly in doing it? In Narnia, when one of the boys enters in and meets the witch, she seduces him and hits a, a soft spot, his desire for something to eat, for something sweet called Turkish delight, for candy. For candy, he begins to betray his family. And then she plays on his own sense of being inadequate and being jealous. He's one of four siblings, and he always feels in last place, and he wants to be in first place. He deserves more. And the white witch plays on all those fears that exist in him. When I was younger, I heard a preacher say, evil spends a lot of money on makeup. And it does. Sometimes convincing us that lust is the same thing as love. 
or that envy is the same thing as righteous indignation. Ask the older brother standing outside the house with the father in the story of the prodigal son. Listen, I don't want to spend a lot more time because the Bible doesn't on the origins or the reality of evil in the world. You decide what you think about that. I've sort of told you a few things. But I want to talk a little bit about the responses. And I want to just mention two sort of simple things. When you encounter this in your life, one of the great things you can do is to run away from it. Is to flee. Is to get out of that situation that is dragging you down, harming you, or using you in a way that you know is not what God has for your life. I have this, this memory when I was a boy about 10 years old that has just always stuck with me. When I was a kid, my grandparents got a little camper at a lake at Weiss Lake in Center, Alabama. It was a campground and somewhere around dusk when it was getting dark, I went down to the camp store just to get something to drink from the machine. And I'm walking back from the machine and I hear somebody holler at me, hey boy! And I turn around and look and it was a Honestly, a scary looking old guy. Today, I think maybe he was drunk. I don't know. And, and I sort of walked a little faster. I learned, as I, as I turned around, I saw him running after me. And I can tell you, it's the fastest I've ever run in my life. I don't know that my toes even touched the ground. It was like floating through air. And I ran to the door where my grandmother was, and the door was locked. And I pounded and pounded on that door. And finally, she opened the door and she said, Honey, Grandmother was in the bathroom. <laughs> and she, I said, I don't care. Let me in. And she just hugged me and hugged me. And I tell you that to say, flee from these situations. But don't just run away. I'm not saying that. That's not my word to you today. My word is to flee to something. God in Jesus created the congregations we call the church not for just the reason of everything that we all talk about a lot of times, but something we don't talk about a lot. He created the church for you. So that you can have a church family, brothers and sisters, people that you can flee to, people you can come to that create a sense of community. You and I can't do a lot of this stuff by ourselves. The Bible says in Jesus, we're not supposed to live just on bread alone. We need more than that. And part of the more is the congregation that Jesus has given you. I hope you value your church. These are great people here at Trinity. They love you. And if you're visiting, I don't think you can find a better congregation. I'm biased, but I think it's true. This is a great church who will love you and care for you. Maybe it's a small group that you get a part of. It's a Bible study group, a Sunday school group, where you're studying the Bible together and you create community. So when you need to flee from something, you have somewhere to go. Or maybe it's a spiritual director, somebody in your life where you can talk to. So many times it's getting it out of the open that lifts the burdens and God begins to do His best work for us. It's finding that group. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time resisting chocolate. I, much less the devil. So I need help, right? We need help. And God has given us the help. And God has said also, you can come to me for help. Come to it. I, one of the things that really kept me out of doing some things that I shouldn't be doing as a teenager when I was growing up in Oaks Bluff was my granddaddy. My granddaddy was my hero. I mentioned him a lot to you. I loved him, and he loved me, and he thought so much of me. And I always thought if I ever did something that got back to him, it'd break his heart. And so that kept me from doing it because I knew I'd see him a lot and I loved him and cared for him. So maybe for you it's running to the Bible and every day making an appointment to meet with God. So you're run, reading His Word, your eyes are right before it and you're knowing that you're in the presence of God in prayer. So whatever you do through your day, you know you're going to be with Jesus later on, right? That may help you. I don't know what it will be. But I do know that there are times in our lives when there is something we need more than just running away from. And I'm not saying just get away from things. I'm saying running to God. In Narnia's story, we find that Aslan, the Christ figure, has a deeper magic than the work of the white witch. And so here I want to say to you that sometimes when we think about these things we get into, these situations that we find ourselves in, whether you call it your own fault or the fault of some demonic force leading you away, whatever it is, I want you to know that there is another power at work in this world too. And that power is the line of Judah. That power is God. God in Aslan in the story is on the move. God in Jesus in this world is still on the move in our lives. And you can go to Him and He's working. And sometimes we build up Satan and evil and the situations we find and we think to ourselves a lie that we're trapped and there's no way out of this situation. We're a lost cause. That's not true. 
I love this story of a guy who went to the zoo once and he looked into the wildcat environment cage and he looked at that wildcat and he read the information and thought, boy, that's a ferocious animal. And then he saw a door open into the cage and the guy that was coming in to clean the cage started cleaning and he had his broom or something, you know, and he was doing all his work and he kept waiting. Is the wildcat going to spring on him at any moment? And he didn't. He finally got to where the wildcat was huddled in a corner and he sort of poked his broom toward it a little bit and the cat just moved off. It snarled, but it just moved off. So when the guy came out, the man who had been deserving all this said, said, wow, I said, you must be very brave. And the guy said, no, I ain't particularly brave. He said, well, the, the cat must be tame, right? He said, no, he ain't tame either. He said, well, if you ain't brave and he ain't tame, then why didn't he attack you? And the guy said, well, mister, he's an old cat and he ain't got teeth. <laughs> And really, when it comes down to it, that's the comparison between God's work in the line of Judah in the world and in your life and the work that you and I sometimes do of our own dark, devious natures or of the demonic forces that sometimes want to bring us and drag us down. Don't overestimate His power and underestimate the power of Jesus Christ to save us in this world. I'm asking you to run away from some situations, but don't just keep running. Run to your church and run to your God. And then the second thing I briefly want to say to you is resist. We are called as God's people to try to resist evil. Sometimes standing in the gap on behalf of our weaker brothers and sisters who need it. But there's a way to do it. There's a song in the 60's that Buffalo Springfield, that group sang, and it said, A thousand people in the street singing songs and carrying signs mostly say, Hooray for our side. There's a way to do things. There's a way to resist. And I've seen too many Christians in too many churches that want to just fight evil just like this and pound it and pound it. I, I liken it to this. When I have sometimes get a splinter in my finger or something, I want to get that thing out. It hurts. And I'll squeeze my finger till it's blood red. Sometimes I'll get something and try to pick it out. But I found that over time I tend to do more damage to my finger than the splinter itself actually did. And the best thing for me to do is let it soak for a while. Going about it a different way, and then as it soaks, somehow, I don't know what happens, but the little piece of wood works its way almost all the way out, and I can just pluck it out with some tweezers or something. There's all this stuff that you know about the flooding in, in uh, Louisiana, right? And Glenn's going to be talking to our minister of mission, going to be talking to us about ways we can be involved. But do you remember the stories in Baton Rouge just a few weeks before the flood? What were those stories? There were the stories of racial tension and hatred and bitterness, right? There's a pastor, R.C. Dixon, who's a pastor of a missionary Baptist church in Baton Rouge, and he said, this is what I'm seeing right now. He's an African-American pastor, and he said, I'm seeing right now white men go in and pick up black women and put them in a boat. I'm seeing black men go into houses and take white women and put them on a boat. I'm seeing black men and white men sitting in a boat together, all working together. This is what I'm seeing. He says, the city has been in an uproar and tension, but I have seen God doing something in this city that needed to be done, even though it took a t catastrophe it has brought us together. I want you just to think about that. You and I can resist the devil, evil, Satan, the wrongs of this world, but maybe the best way is not to go about it like this, but to let it soak. Be subversive about it. The simple things you and I do. Share the faith, the hope that you have in you with your friends and your family and your co-workers and the students that go to school with you. It's a simple thing, but share why you have hope and why you go to church and you think your family is important. Be a neighbor. The first people who were called Christians were not because some preacher or missionary went and presented the gospel to them. It's because people who were Christians moved in next door to them. And folks began to see them and they said, we're attracted to your church because we see how you take care of widows, the neediest of our, of our group. And we see when you have funerals that you grieve, but you don't grieve as those who have no hope. And it drew people to them. And in Antioch, they were first called Christians because they were simply being good neighbors to them. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Robert Capon, one of my favorite writers, said, this is how Jesus did it. He came and did His work and He said it's the left-handed power of God, not the right-handed power that did His work. So Jesus said to us, if you have faith just as small as a mustard seed, you can't say to the mountain, be cast into the sea. 
Be salt. Be light. Be like yeast that gets in the dough. Nobody sees it, but it has a way to make everything rise. Turn the other cheek. Walk the second mile. Offer a cloak. Most of us are never going to do really great big things for God in the world. Most of us are going to write a lot of little checks. 97 cents, $1.44. We're going to do a lot of little things over time that God will use to do God's work in this world. And the tools we use, they're not hate. They're not fighting fire with fire. They're parables. They're testimonies. It's prayer. It's reading our Bibles. It's trying our level best to live for Jesus the best we know how out in the world. And when you do that, God wins. When you simply be who God has asked you to be. At the end of our Bibles in the book of Revelation, an angel will come and take Satan, the great adversary of God, and bind him up and throw him into the lake of fire and sulfur where he will stay forever and ever away from us. In the story of Narnia, we're told that Aslan is on the move, and as he does, winter without Christmas dissolves and melts away. There's a great story in there where the children are running from the white witch and her sleigh and they hear the sleigh bells and they are scared. And I wanted to close with this story because I think it's pretty cool. And it's a reminder of God's work in our world. Everyone, when they saw the sleigh stopped, was scared. But then when they saw the man with a hood that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest, everyone knew him because... Though you see people of this sort in Narnia, you see pictures of them, and you hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look out only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, he said. She's kept me out for a long time, but I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get by being solemn and still. My prayer for you is that you feel that deep shiver of gladness even in the sufferings and the pain and the struggles that you and I encounter in this world, because there is a greater power at work. Can you feel it? Even now, the witch's magic is weakening. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.